Hi folks, here we are, part four of chemistry. Um, in this quick lecture, we're gonna dive into the next step in building the complexity of a human body. Remember that thus far we've learned how to build atoms from subatomic particles. We've learned about the structure of atoms, where the different subatomic particles are located, what their mass and masses and charges are. And we've learned how to draw Bohr diagrams of different elements. The next step up in the hierarchy of life is to take atoms and use them to create molecules. Now, as I've said in the past, atoms um, are used to create molecules, which are two or more atoms held together by a bit of energy. And the technical term for that energy is chemical bond. Now, true chemical bonds are what are called intramolecular forces. The prefix intra means within. So these are forces that act within the molecule to hold it together. Remember that we talked about the octet rule, um, and that is sort of rule of thumb um, that says that atoms that have more than a single energy shell are most stable when they have a full shell. And that full or valence shell, um, the outermost shell, is going to can contain up to eight electrons, right? The first shell can only contain two electrons. Well, almost all of the atoms, um, the different types of atoms, the elements, don't have a full valence shell. Only seven out of 118, in fact, have a full valence shell. And so the only way to get a full valence shell for most elements is for the atoms to form bonds with other elements. So atoms form bonds to get a full valence shell, and the result of making a bond is a molecule or compound. Molecule is the more general term. Compound, sort of like a compound word, you have two different elements that are present. I usually just use the word molecule, um, and I really don't care that you guys know the distinction. You'll get that in chemistry. All right, so a molecule is represented with what we call a chemical formula. Chemical formula is an ingredient list. So the ingredients are represented by the symbols from the periodic table, um, which remember are symbols, right? They're not letters, so case matters. Um, so we've got two symbols here, the symbol for hydrogen, and we have the symbol for oxygen. There's also a notation called a subscript, or there can be, that tells us how many atoms of the element that's directly in front of the subscript, how many atoms of that element you have. So in this case, we have two atoms of hydrogen, right? If there is just one atom of an element, we don't put a subscript um, because if there were two, we'd have a two, and if there were zero, we wouldn't have the symbol. So we have one, oxygen atom, two hydrogens. Now, you, we also, you'll also often see, so this is the actual formula, you'll also often see what's called a coefficient. That coefficient is in front of the formula, right? So it's before anything else. Uh, it's always a number. And that tells you how many molecules you have. And one way of thinking about it is 
the coefficient is, you know, in math, if you have a number that's in front of a parentheses, I'm going to make the parentheses red like our box is there, then you would multiply everything inside the parentheses by that number, right? So the reason for saying that is that the um, that coefficient applies to all of the elements present in the formula. So if I have six molecules of H2O, that means I have a total of six times two or 12 hydrogen atoms and six times one or six oxygen atoms. So we describe the process of creating, actually creating or breaking bonds using a shorthand notation called a chemical equation. And the ingredients are called reactants. Those are the things that are going to be combined, react together. And what comes out at the end of the process is called a product. So in this example, we have one atom of carbon and one molecule of molecular oxygen. Right. So this is not a single, it's not a random oxygen uh, atom. It's actually an oxygen bound to another oxygen. Then we have this arrow. The arrow <clears throat> actually means equals or yields, right? We use an arrow rather than an equal sign when we, <clears throat> because we want to show the direction that this reaction is going, right? So if I'm building CO2, which is carbon dioxide from carbon and oxygen. If I'm talking about the building of CO2, my arrow is going to point this way. Chemists are super fond of shorthand. And so you, once you get to chemistry, you often see reactions that are written like this. And that means it's a reaction that could go in either direction. So instead of writing C, carbon plus O2 yields carbon dioxide, um, and then writing carbon dioxide yields C plus O2, you just use this notation. All right, so for a chemical bond to form, you need a couple of things. You need availability. Um, you have to have elements, the atoms of the elements you want to react present in the same location, same basic location. Otherwise, nothing can happen. You need enough energy, so the atoms are going to have to collide with one another, not just in the right orientation, so with the um, directions being appropriate, but you have to have just the right amount of energy. So too much energy, and you're going to end up with the atoms bouncing into one another and bouncing off without a bond forming, like a high-speed car accident. Or too slow, not enough motion energy, and there's not going to be enough force to destabilize any bonds that might exist. So in our example before of carbon plus O2, right, if there's not enough energy present to break the bond between the two oxygen atoms and destabilize it, then you're never going to end up with the product. Last but in no way least, you need something referred to as electron compatibility. And the best way to think about electron compatibility is that atoms that have electron compatibility are capable of becoming more stable
by sharing or transferring their electrons. So remember the octet rule. Most atoms, number one, don't have a full valence shell, and number two, they aren't stable until they have a full valence shell. And that simple idea is what drives all chemical bonding. So two basic types of bond, ionic and covalent. And we will start with ionic bonding. Ionic bonds form when atoms with electron compatibility give up and a different atom then takes on an electron. And in so doing, both of them either achieve a full valence shell or become closer to a full valence shell. This is transfer of electrons. Okay, so transfer of electrons. Now to understand how this works, you need to remember a couple things. First, protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. In chemical reactions, the number of protons can't change, meaning you can't change one element into another. So if I have an element that has seven valence electrons, right, it's close to eight, it's almost stable, but not quite there. And I have another element that has a single valence electron, but has a full shell underneath that single valence electron. If those two are close to one another, so let's look at an example. If I have lithium, which has three protons, right? Three protons means it's gonna be, have three electrons, so there are my electrons. And close to it, I have another element, for example, fluorine, which has nine protons. So two, because I have to start in the closest shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? The fluorine is very close to being stable. And it's kind of difficult to believe this, um, but the lithium is fairly close to being stable too. If only it could get rid of this valence electron, because if it could, then it has a full valence shell underneath. And a full valence shell, and please write this down, a full valence shell is far more important um, than a balance of, of charge within the atom. So let's look at what happens. If these two are near one another, this electron is going to be pulled away, right? There are a lot more protons in fluorine, and so it's much more likely to be able to pull that atom away. Oops, let me go back over that. And then the lithiums has a full shell. Now here's the thing, and this is why this is what defines an ionic bond. The right, we still have three protons, three positive charges. But here we now have two electrons. And that means that this lithium now is what we call an ion. Put a bracket around it to show that. And we have to put a charge here. So now this is a charged particle. Plus three minus two gives us a plus one charge. Sometimes this is difficult for students to kind of get, get in their heads, but think about it this way. Electrons are negative. You, if you get rid of something negative, you're going to become more positive. 
the fluorine still has nine protons, but now it has 10 electrons. And so it is going to have, right, minus 10 plus 9 gives us minus, a minus 1 charge. And remember electrostatic attraction? Remember how I said it was this really fundamental thing to understand? Here's one, another place where it shows up. Oppositely charged particles are attracted to one another. I like to call it electrostatic love because I'm a dork. Um, that's an ionic bond. So atoms transfer electrons in order to get a full shell. That shift in the number of electrons, when the proton's number doesn't change, creates oppositely charged ions. And those opposite charges draw the two together. Now, we have two separate but separate but op and oppositely charged electron clouds in this case, right? And that's different than what we're going to see with the covalent bond. All right. So this is um, an animation that will sh that shows you the formation of a sodium chloride one <clears throat> molecule of sodium chloride. Sodium has 11 protons, starts with 11 electrons. It has one valence electron if we drew out the Bohr structure. Chlorine has 17 protons, 17 electrons as an atom. But if these two are close to one another, chlorine is very close to being stable also very close to a full valence shell. The sodium is really far from a full valence shell. And so that electron from the sodium, that outer valence electron is going to be drawn over. So this is a little clear demonstration of the, of the same uh, bond formation between sodium and chlorine. Just so you have this in your head, a cation is a positively charged ion. When electrons are given away, the ion that forms has a positive charge because you've given something negative away. An anion forms, a negatively charged ion forms when an atom accepts an additional electron. All right, so let's look at how we would do a Bohr structure. So lithium, three protons, and I'm going to draw this. I'm going to draw the atoms first. Right, and I would suggest that for you guys, if you're not used to this, figure out the number of subatomic particles first before you do anything else. So there's a lithium atom. Here is a chlorine atom, so 17 protons, 17 electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, can't fit any more, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. All right, so if these two are close to one another, the valence electron from the lithium is going to be transferred to the chlorine, right? So I'm going to get rid of this valence shell. And to show this in a Bohr diagram, right, I've now got two electrons, one, two, three protons, which means I have a 
plus one charge. The brackets are the way that you um, indicate that, at least for us at this level, it's the way you're going to indicate that electron transfer has occurred. So for the chlorine, right, it's got 17 protons. Now it's got 18 electrons. So it is has a negative one charge, and they are drawn together by electrostatic attraction. And that is an ionic bond. All right, covalent bonds. So covalent bonding involves true sharing of valence electrons. So this is not here have a cookie, right? This is we're eating the same cookie at the same time. Um, and that has a, a number of different um, effects. One thing I want to point out, right, you know, valence electrons are the outer shell electrons, and the prefix co means together. So a covalent bond means that the valence electrons are together. You have a single electron cloud in this case, single uncharged electron cloud. So in this animation, what we're seeing is the reaction between two atoms of hydrogen, single proton, single electron. Each hydrogen becomes stable and has a full shell by sharing. If we want to show that this molecule, which would have formula H2, because two hydrogens, we would have our two hydrogen nuclei. We draw the valence shell. Whoops, I did not put them close enough together. And to show that it's covalent, you overlap the valence shells. And then you put the shared electrons on the circles that represent. All right, so you can look at a Bohr diagram and come up with a chemical formula. Boom. And you can also look at a formula and generate a Bohr diagram. So true sharing of valence electrons. In, this is the formation of water from hydrogen and oxygen, and this is a it's a slightly unusual drawing um, in that the we're not shown the lower level electrons for oxygen, and they're using the symbols rather than the number of protons. One of the reasons why it's important to use the uh, points of the compass or uh, for locations on an analog clock way of drawing Bohr diagrams is that as you move along in chemistry, you will realize more and more that the shape of molecules has a lot uh, to do with their function. It's another example of structure equals function. So, this is, right, if I look at this picture, I've got a single electron cloud, and I can figure out from the atoms that are present that that's H2O, which is water. Water is bent. It actually has a bent shape. And by drawing the Bohr diagram in this way, you can... Um, it makes it very easy to see that. That bent shape is going to become important later on. Last thing I want to point out from this slide, because this will really help us we move along. Remember I said chemists love shorthand. Well, it turns out that, remember that the element symbol stands in for the number of protons and vice versa. It's also the case that this dash means a single pair of shared electrons. Right? And it's m once you have the 
four diagrams in your head um, and sort of what they what they mean, then you get to start drawing structures like this, which take a lot less time. So if you have a single dash, you have one pair of shared electrons. If you have two dashes, so if I have, uh, if I see something like this, which is the way that oxygen is bound to itself, that means I have two pairs of shared electrons between those two oxygens. All right, so we already drew the, the hydrogen gas, the H2 diagram. So now let's look at methane, which is CH4. So word to the wise, start when you're drawing these, start with the atom that has the greatest number of valence electrons, because that will then make it really simple to see how things are going to fit together most times. So I've got carbon. I'm going to have my periodic table out when I'm doing this. So I know carbon has six protons, which means it's going to have six electrons. So there is my inner two. And then, so one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so this formula tells me what? I've got one carbon and four hydrogens. Well, that kind of makes sense if I look at this now because, and I apply the octet rule, because I'm missing an electron here, for carbon that is, here, here, and here. If I dr just draw a single hydrogen, right? It has a single electron. How many does it need to be stable? Two. All right. So I have a whole bunch of hydrogen, a whole bunch of carbon, because you never have just one of anything, it turns out, in chemistry. You have moles, um, which I'm not even going to talk about in this class, um, but you will eventually in chemistry. So one hydrogen can share. Now the hydrogen is happy. Imagine my air quotes there. Um, and now the carbon experiences the universe as though it had five valence electrons. Still not stable. So we've got another hydrogen we can put in there. The, hydro the second hydrogen also stable. The carbon now has six valence electrons Still not stable, but getting closer. All right now, almost there. One more hydrogen. So the chemical formula is really, right? You can see, hopefully, now. Uh, come on, Sam. You can hopefully see now why carbon, if you have carbon and hydrogen together, they are going to combine in a one carbon to four hydrogen ratio because everything's driven by the need to have a full valence shell. All right, next we're going to start talking about different kinds of covalent bonds. Yeah, I know, 